quickly first a uh, little advertisement. My name is Scott Breckner and I teach uh, Learn 11 and the study skills workshops through our department here. If you are looking for a three unit class in the spring that'll help you to be a better student, Learn 11's a good one, whether I teach it or somebody else. And also these workshops are going to be held again in the spring. So if you find this workshop helpful today, there are gonna be about 12 or 13 more starting the third week of the spring. that will always be on Wednesday at 12. I'm not sure if it'll be in this room or some other room around here, but you can just keep that in mind. And we always start the third week of the semester, so there will be new schedules up on the front counter probably the first week of spring, and you could stop by and sort of check that out. And if anything looks of interest, or if you have another teacher who gives you extra credit, you know where to find me, okay? Now, uh, this workshop is being repeated mostly because in some ways it's the most helpful one or close to it. I um, want to ask a really quick question. Uh, anybody here have at least one final coming up that has multiple choice questions on it? Okay, I'm assuming most of you do. If not, uh, you will. Uh, multiple choice is the most commonly given test question in college. And a lot of people, when it comes to multiple choice, do some things wrong that causes them to kind of sabotage themselves and not do as well as they should. So before we get to multiple choice, I'm going to give you three general test taking strategies and these are strategies that are supposed to help a student to get off to a good start on a test no matter what kind of test it is so whether it's essay or multiple choice or whatever now um, I do need to say one thing before I write these up here if you haven't studied this will not help you I'm not a miracle worker so some people are always looking for the last little uh, trick if you've studied and it's all up there this is supposed to help you to get all of it out on the test. There's nothing worse than half hour later as you're driving home thinking, uh, and you remember half the answers that you forgot during the test. That's not good. So the first one of these, when students you, uh, get their test, hopefully they read the directions. But then the next thing that most people do is they start reading the first question and just go, you know, because again, the clock has started and they feel pressure. But actually, one of the smartest things you could do, I don't know if you do this now, is to take about one minute or less and preview the test. So just quickly look through the booklet, look at the different parts of the test, if there are different parts, and actually, the reason you do this will make more sense in just a minute, but there are two pieces of information you're looking for when you do the preview. The first one is the number of questions that will be on the test. Sometimes teachers make that very clear ahead of time, sometimes they don't. And then the other would be the types of questions. So are there different sections of the test or is it all just sort of one type? Now, I'm going to put up here something I'm going to illustrate again in a, in a minute. Let's say that you have 50 questions on a test. First 30, multiple choice. The next 10, true, false. And then the last 10, matching. Something like that. Some teachers set up their tests like this. Other teachers mix everything together. But one of the smartest things you could do is do this quick preview and then do one more thing. And this is primarily what I'm about to show you here for Scantron type tests. So if you have a written test or a combination of a Scantron and a written one, that's a little more complicated. But what you're going to try to do before you start, which again should just take a few seconds, is to calculate. And you're not using a calculator. Hopefully you can use this one. By this time of the semester, people saying batteries are low. I got a recharge and we're all looking forward to that. But this should be really easy for you even if math is your worst subject. Um, let's say, for example, that you were going to be in here from 12 o'clock to 1 o'clock, even though you're not, and I was going to give you a test. Okay, So when I hand you the test, your first little calculation is to figure out what time it's going to be halfway through the test. That's usually pretty easy to figure out. So what would it be here? Yeah, 1230. So what you would actually do would be to write that time down, maybe in the corner of your Scantron or wherever. And then one more thing to write down, based on the number of questions, maybe there are 50 of them. So what's half of 50? 25. 25. So that's about as, as difficult as the math gets. And so that's your little code, your little calculation. Okay, as soon as you do that, 
you're basically ready to start. And of course, the purpose behind this, and I don't know you well enough to know whether this has ever been an issue, but sometimes students get stuck on one part of a test. They spend way too much time on it, or just in general, they're going at a very slow pace, and they end up running out of time near the end and having to rush. And tests are hard enough to do well on anyway, but when your time management during the test is not good, it makes it even harder. So this is designed primarily for the slower test taker. If you get to 1230 in our example, and this is around where you should be, and you've answered maybe 16 questions by then, that shows that you're behind where you should be, and it's not time to panic yet because you still have a half hour left, but you just have to pick up the speed a little. Maybe you've been reading every question four times, looking at the choices five times. Now you have to maybe cut it down to two and just start going a little bit faster. And so if you get to this midway point and you count the number of questions you've answered and it's somewhere in this region, you can just relax, take a breath, and keep going the way you're going. But if you're behind, it helps you to spot that. And I always look at this almost like it's taking your temperature halfway through. And you kind of look and go, oh, normal, good or slow down or speed up. Usually it's the speed up part. So this will help a lot just to make sure you're on the right track. It kind of reassures you or pushes you a little bit. Okay, and then the last one of these strategies, and then we'll get to the multiple choice. Um, I'm gonna ask you a stupid question, so that means you're supposed to know the answer, no pressure, okay? And that is, what question number do most students start on when they take a test? Yeah, number one, why? Because it's number one. Okay, so that, as I said, that's a dumb question. Are you, do you have to start at number one? No. Why would you ever not want to do that? Yeah, if it's hard. Okay, and the purpose behind this is, and this is the reason that you do this survey and you kind of look at the different parts of the test if there are, one of the things that students hardly ever do or think about is this. Whenever you're taking any kind of test, you want to go with your strength first. It's really important to get off to a good start at anything in life because it helps you calm down and gain some confidence and momentum. And um, what a lot of students do, again, just sort of blindly without thinking about it, is they begin at the beginning because that seems logical. And if you were to do this preview and you happen to notice that this was your test, one of the smartest things you could do as a test taker is to take a look just quickly. It's not like you're reading every question, but look at these and you think, wow, these look tough. A lot of these are really long. These look a little tricky. This looks pretty good. I could do this. And if that's the case, then where do you start? There, and you might end up doing these, then these, then these, okay? Um, when you hand in a Scantron, no teacher is good enough to look at that and say, oh, you started on 41. They have no idea, right? It doesn't matter to them as long as you get a good score, that doesn't matter. So um, one thing that I would love to have you remember for the rest of college is this, and I know this to be true because I've been teaching forever, and that is um, the first five minutes of any test you ever take are by far the most important to help determine whether you get a good grade or not. Not the last five, not five in the middle, not any other five, but the first five. And here's why. When you walk in to take a test, like your final's coming up, you sit there, and regardless of how you've done all semester, every student in the class is tied for first on the final because nobody started yet, right? So it's like a clean slate. If you do anything in the first five minutes of a test that causes you to doubt yourself, panic, blank out, whatever, you start here, everybody starts here, and you start to kind of unravel, and usually once that happens, it just gets worse and worse and worse. If you do things in the first five minutes that help you to gain confidence, relax, get some answers right, in other words, get off to a good start, you tend to build on that and it goes this way. So you're gonna go one direction or another, and I know which one you wanna go in, and so if you just automatically start at the beginning, which might be the hardest section of the class for you, or the test, when you actually start reading those questions and you can't quite figure them out, then you start doubting what you studied, you doubt yourself and everything, and it just tends to fall apart after that. So it's a very good idea to look through and start wherever you think you can do well. I've had a few students say, what happens if you have no strength? 
uh, then good luck to you, okay? But usually when a test has two or more parts, there's at least one part that looks less scary than the other parts or at least, or easier. And you want to try to start there if you possibly can. Um, so, as I said, none of this will help if you haven't studied, but the idea is that you take a minute, you get yourself planned, you got an organized way of doing it, and then you start well. And if you do that, again, things tend to get better from there, okay? Any questions on those three? Okay, so the main part of the teaching today is about multiple choice tests. And as I mentioned, in college, I know it depends a little on your major and the classes you take, but multiple choice is the most commonly given test in college. So I'm going to teach you something that is the best study skill I know. And in all these workshops and in my classes, I teach dozens of study skills all through a semester, and I think they're all good, otherwise I wouldn't teach them. But this one is the winner, okay? And so what this is officially called, and it, I should probably come up with a fancier name than this, but this is what it's called, is the multiple choice method, okay? And I'll tell you just as a really quick background that um, I was taught this method my senior year of high school, a long time ago, and I used this on every multiple choice test I took in college, and it helped me get good grades and graduate and all that. I've taught this to thousands of people, I think now over the years, and had a lot of people come back saying, I tried what you mentioned, and my grade went up a little. Other people say it went up a whole grade or two. Never had a student come and grab me and say, how dare you, whatever. So nobody has gone down that I'm aware of. Everybody has at least helped a little, and any help is good. I think that's kind of the attitude. So um, here's the way this works. What we're going to say, just to keep this really simple, is that the test that you have in front of you that you're about to start has 50 questions, and they're all multiple choice. There, there aren't even multiple sections, they're all the same. So after you've done the quick preview and you've done your little calculation of where you should be halfway through, then you're going to start at number one because, again, they're all the same. Here's the first thing that I don't know if you've ever tried before, but most students say they haven't, and that is you're going to be what I call a two-handed test taker, which sounds kind of strange. And that is that you're going to take your non-writing hand, which for most is their left, and you're going to take it and put it down on the test booklet, and you're going to cover up all of the choices for question number one. Not like this. So you can look in there and all that. You may be tempted, but no peeking. This is a no peek method. You read the question, not looking at the choices at all, and then ask yourself a simple question, which is, what's the answer? What did my book say or what did the teacher say? What do I have in here about that? Okay. When you do that, you're going to end up having one of four results. And this is going to sound really bad for a minute, so you just have to sort of bear with me on this. One of these results is good, and the other three are bad. And that doesn't look too good, but again, it gets better. Here's the first uh, possible result, and this is the one you want all the time, but you don't get. You cover up the choices, you read the question, the answer pops in your head, you take your hand away, and there it is. And life is wonderful and all that, right? And I wish they were all like that, but they're not going to be. So for the next few minutes, I'm going to refer to these as the easy ones. They didn't take any time. They didn't take much effort or brain power. You just knew it right away, OK? The first bad result is pretty much guaranteed to happen to you at least every once in a while. It did to me. You cover up the choices. You read the question. The answer pops in your head. You take your hand away and, yeah, it's not there. And you keep looking, saying, I know for sure the answer is just not one of those. Well, that's not too good. What happened? I don't know. You got confused. You misread something. Something went wrong somewhere. So these are the ones that I call the not there ones. And that's probably going to happen if you do this method again with the covering up at least a couple times when you go through the test. So the question is, what do you do if that happens? And the first, don't panic. Second, uh, rather than going back and saying, I must have misread that and start over, it's a lot better for you to skip it and come back later. And I'll explain a little bit of why in a, in a few minutes. Okay, now, um, if the test that you're taking that we're describing here 
is really easy and you're just sailing along toward an A, there's no sweat going, you're just fine. This is probably going to be the most common result that you get. But for most students on most tests, this is the moment of truth. How you do on these that I'm about to describe will determine whether you get a really good grade or not. So these are huge. What these are called, and I'll explain what this means in just a second, is the challenging ones. I always like this word better than hard or difficult because challenging sounds like you could do it. You just have to put a little effort in. And what does it look like when you experience this on the test? Here's how it works basically. You cover up the choices, you read the question, as you're reading it, you recognize what it's asking. You remember reading that in the book or hearing it in class and you know it's in there and this is your basic reaction. Oh, yeah, 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 that's, what is that? That is, uh... and you can't think of it. What do you want to do? Okay, but none of that, okay? Give it about 10 seconds of searching and trying to think and if you can't come up with it, then skip those two, okay? And then the fourth result, the worst one, is when you cover up the choices and you read the question and as soon as you finish, a big frown comes to you, you read it again and then you look to see if you have the right test and look to see if you're even in the right room because you've never seen what that's asking in your life. You have no idea. So that means you're going to have to make a totally wild guess. That happens to most people at least once or twice on every test you take, no matter how hard you study. So these are the ones that I like to just be honest and call impossible. It's not impossible to uh, get it right because you could get lucky and just pick a letter, but to know the answer is impossible because something went wrong and you didn't study it or whatever it might have been. Now, I want to ask a, a quick question of you. You can either just share from personal experience or just what you would think about students in general. I've asked a lot of students this question. When you're taking a test and you get to a question and you read it and you think, I have no idea, what do you do? And what do you think most people do? Yes. Yeah, they just, and I've had people say they sat there, they closed their eyes and they did this. I'm feeling B or C or whatever and they're just like waiting for a letter to come and so they just fill it in and get it over with. You know, I don't know so I've, f f well, that's actually not the best idea. What do you think I want you to do with those? Yeah, skip them. That, that's always the right answer in this method, okay? Now, um, I don't know what your habits are when you take tests but what most people tell me, and this is a good thing, is that they go through the test and every once in a while they get to a question that stumps them a little or they want to think about more so they skip it and go back. Okay, that's pretty common. But if you take a test this way, all the way down, just the way I taught you, you are almost guaranteed to skip way more questions than you ever have before. And that makes people nervous at first, but it doesn't have to and I'm going to show you why. So again, which uh, questions are you answering the first time through? The easy ones, right? Um, how many of those are there going to be? I have no idea. It depends on you. But I just want to show you something. I'll give these numbers as examples, and they're kind of shocking. Let's say that the first time through, you answer 20 questions. Okay? So let's see how good you are with math. How many are you skipping? 30. 30. What grade does that look like you're headed for? Yeah, uh, I would guess F or maybe if you sort of made a good comeback, a D if you're lucky. It looks awful and it'd be easy to start panicking there. But the reason that you can stay very positive and calm is because of what comes right now. This is like the, the good news about this, okay? After you've been through all the questions once, you're going to go back up to the start of the test, find the first question you skipped, cover up the choices, and read the question again same thing that you did before. Okay? Um, what do you think is going to happen fairly often when you go to these questions the second time and cover up the choices and read, it, read them? You realize maybe a mistake was made or what mistake was made. That's a possibility. By the way, I forgot to mention that most of the ones the second time through are going to be those challenging ones that you recognize and kind of know that you know, sort of, right? Well, um, 
Not on all these, I would love to say that, but on many of these, something strange will happen, it's good strange, and that is you cover up the choices and you read the question again, the answer pops right in your head, and that's always kind of surprising, and you take your hand away, and there it is. And you think, all right, that's good. 10 minutes earlier, or 15 minutes earlier, that seemed kind of like a tough one, and now it's easy. Well. To show you again how important these are, I'm going to just use this number as an example and say almost all the rest of the questions fall into that category. Is what I just described going to happen with all of these? No, but it'll happen with a lot of them. And so I want to see if you can figure out why that is. So that's your, your test for the day, okay, since we're talking about tests. Um, why would a question seem easier 10 or 15 minutes after you gave it a try the first time? What's going on in your brain that makes that true? You're somewhat familiar with the question already because you've looked over it once. That's part of it. And what else? You know when you look at uh, 50 questions, right? That's what you did the first time. Mm -hmm. You see them all, right? Sometimes you see something in one question, starts uh, right, connecting in the other. That's part of it. But here's my favorite example. I'm going to give you two uh, illustrations of this. Um, I'm sure that all of you have had this happen to you, some more than others. Some people, when I describe this, they say that happens every day. Other times, it's occasionally. Okay? You're, tr you, you're trying to remember someone's name, and you know their name. And you're talking to somebody, and you say, yeah, his name is, uh, give me a minute. His name is, um, it's right on the tip of my tongue. His name, and you can't think of it. And you're thinking, what is wrong with me? I know that name. What usually happens at that point if you keep pushing yourself to try to remember it? What usually happens? Yeah, it usually gets further and further away. And you get more and more frustrated thinking, why can't I think of it? So what do you finally do? You give up, right? And then the weirdness happens. Ten minutes later, three hours later, the next day you're walking down the street. And you're saying, I've got to go to the store. And, I got, and then the name just comes out of your mouth. And you're like, where did that come from? Oh, oh, yeah. Yesterday I was trying to remember the name of that teacher I had a few years ago. And then it just comes out when you didn't even ask it to. That's pretty weird, right? That happens to everybody. Why is that? It's because our brains are a lot more like computers than we give them credit for. And if you cover up the choices on a question on a test and you read it and you think, you go searching for about 10 seconds, you can't find it, and you just let it go, and you go on to other things, what is your brain doing while you're doing the other things? Still searching. It's like looking for a file. And when you come back around to it the second time, you end up sometimes reading the question. And your brain is like this. I found it. It's right there. I couldn't find it before, but I found it. And so things just start clicking better than they did at the beginning. So that means one of the worst things you could do, actually, as a test taker is to sit there and read a question and then think, oh, that was right there in chapter two. I can even picture the page that was on. What is that? I know that. And keep pushing and pushing and pushing. Because usually the longer you do that, the more frustrated you get, the further it gets away, like those names, and wasting time. So you just let it go and trust that it's in there. It'll come out in a little while. Okay, That's kind of the process. The other reason why this order seems to help people a lot is because of this. Um, before a person goes out and exercises in a really strenuous way by running or playing a sport or whatever, what are they supposed to do first? Warm up, Warm up right? Stretch. Why do they do that? <coughs> yeah, one is, yeah, one's not to get hurt. And I always tell people this. Um, in my uh, many years of teaching, I won't tell you how long, I have never had a student in the middle of a test do this. Oh, pulled muscle. Yeah got to go to the nurse or whatever and kind of limp out of the room. So that has nothing to do with testing. But the other one, what did you say again? Get it gets you ready, right? So when, even if you're the worst runner, the worst basketball player, whatever it is, when you get all loosened up and you step out to do what it is, you should be able to hit the ground running and perform up to your capabilities, wherever those are. Well, when you walk in to take a test in college, unless the test is incredibly easy, and there aren't too many of those, when you sit down, the way you always want to think of it is, I need a mental warm-up before I get to the strenuous things, just like physically. And 
That's what this is for. So the first time through the test, if I had a camera on you, I should never see you do this. <sighs> That's too strenuous, right? You just answer the easy ones, let the other ones go. I'm not warmed up yet, I'll get to them later. And stay very kind of relaxed and just get whatever you can get. And then when you go back later and you get to these, you are as calm as you're ever gonna get. You're as confident as you're ever gonna get because you've answered some questions right and your brain is working the best it's ever going to so now you can dive in and think hard and answer the more challenging questions. So that's the purpose behind that. Okay, and then um, how many do we have left in this example? Three. Okay, which ones are the three? Yeah, um, whatever you were confused about, that's probably taken care of by now. So these are the impossible ones. Okay. Now, if you're taking a test with 50 questions on it and three of them look completely unknown to you, that's not too bad. If this is 13 or 23, you didn't study right, okay? But everybody has at least a few. So you remember I mentioned a few minutes ago, and you kind of helped me with this, most people when they get to an impossible question, fill in a bubble and get it over with. <clears throat> Actually, there are two really good reasons why it's a smart move for you as a test taker to wait till the very end to answer the impossible questions. One of them has to do with this, and I never know how to say this any better than this, but it is total luck. And what I mean by that is you've read all the questions once, you've read a lot of them twice, you're hoping that something in there causes this little light. It may just be a tiny light to come on where you say, wait a minute, I kind of do remember a little about that. And if you do, I don't think you'd still be able to know the answer for sure, but maybe you could eliminate a couple choices and make a more educated guess. Sometimes when you leave things to the end, you get lucky. Sometimes you don't get lucky. You look at it at the very end and think, yep, still have no clue. And so then you go ahead and mark it. But the second reason, which I think is even more important than that, has to do with time. Okay, and I want to give you a little illustration of this. I have heard this story or a version of it many times over the years from students. Okay, a student comes to me and they tell me that they just got a test back in one of their classes and there were 50 questions on the Scantron. <clears throat> when they got it back, they saw that dreaded pink line next to the number 49 and 50 and some other ones along the way and they show it to me. Well, so what's the, what's the big deal with that? Well, here's what they say. They said, I wasn't paying attention to the time. So they didn't do that calculation I mentioned a little earlier. And they were on number 40 or so. And the teacher said, that horrible thing teachers say, three minutes. And then they looked down at the, and then they started reading the questions really fast and then going quickly. And you know what happens when you go quickly, right? Bad things happen. They looked at the test itself and they were so frustrated by the fact that they missed these two because these were two of the easiest questions on the test for them. They knew those answers. The reason they missed them is because they were hurrying at the end. And so um, <coughs> one of the main sad parts of this is that usually when they tell me that, the next thing they say is, and I missed an A or a B or a C by one point or two points, which means if they had gotten those right, which they should have, just that, that alone would have boosted them up to the next grade. So the reason that this order is so important to follow is that you're trying to get all the easy questions done in the first 15, 20 minutes of a test before the time becomes an issue at all. And where are the easy questions gonna be for you? They could be anywhere, right? And so uh, you're kind of finding all the easy ones all the way through, and then it's almost like you're taking them and putting them in your pocket and saying, okay, those are safe, those are done. And then at the very end, if you have to rush, it's a lot better to rush on these because what are you gonna do, make a careless mistake? You don't even know the answer anyway. So you just leave them to the end, hope for luck, and if not, just pick a letter, any letter, and hope that you're lucky. And so again, you're just trying to manage your way through a test and squeeze out every possible point that you can. That's kind of the idea behind that one, okay? Any questions on that so far? I have a couple more things that I wanna share about it. Okay, and again, uh, sign-in sheet, name, student ID, teacher's name, 
and then circulate it. And uh, my job later today, or otherwise you'll kill me, is to contact all your teachers and tell them that you came. So I, I always do that later in the same day as the workshop. Um, okay, now there are about three more things that I want to share with you about this, and then we'll be, uh, we'll be done with the workshop. The first one, I want to see if you can figure something out. Um, I've made a big deal as I've taught through this about the importance of using the hand to cover up the choices and probably you've never done that before. What most people do when they have a multiple choice test, and this seems to make sense but it's not a good thing, is that they read the question and then without any thinking at all they look at all the choices and then they look back and forth and try to figure it out. That sounds like what you would do. Um, can you think of any benefit or advantage that a student might have if they cover up the choices and read the question first rather than doing it the other way? What's the, the purpose of that? Anybody have an idea? One, one of them is that it usually helps your memory to kick in better. That's true, but there's something else Everybody here, probably this semester, has one teacher who I, you think they stay up at night and try to figure out ways to trick me on tests. They don't, at least I hope not, but that's what it seems like sometimes. And so when you read a multiple choice question, let's say that you have the question here and then you have the four answers. Let's say that C is the right answer, okay? You know what a right answer is called on a multiple choice test? It's called the right answer. What are the wrong answers called? They actually have a name, believe it or not, and there are two of them, and I really like both of these words because even though they're similar, they describe their only reason for living, and that is their decoys or distractors. So that means that these three, the only job they have is to sit there trying to look really good and tempt you to pick them rather than the right answer. And what a lot of teachers do uh, intentionally or otherwise, is out of the four choices, at least three of them look good, are close to each other, probably could be right, sometimes all four. And so this is the thought process that goes through students' minds a lot if they don't do what I've mentioned to you. They read the question, no thinking at all, they look at the four choices, and then they sit back, look back and forth, and they think, hmm, let's see. Well, I think B is the, yeah, B, that's it. B is the right answer. But actually, C looks pretty, well, actually, and then D looks pretty good, too. You're dead. Okay, by then, you're dead. And I've actually had students tell me that they had that happen, what I just described, and then they actually closed their eyes and said, like they were trying to erase everything. Okay, wait, what did my book say about that, or what did my teacher say? And then after about five seconds, they say they open their eyes like this. I don't even know what it said anymore. I'm all confused. So that means you've allowed the teacher to trick you or confuse you with the wrong answers. Again, tests are hard enough as it is without letting your mind go down the wrong path because the teacher has tricked you. So um, the basic reason for covering up the choices is so that you can read the question and then think. That's always nice to do on a test without being influenced in any way by anything. And usually when you do that, you feel more in control of things. And when answers come to you and you find them, you feel like your brain is actually working and I can do this. It kind of is a good uh, uh, confidence booster during a test. Now, um, having said that, though, there's one other thing that I need to uh, mention. And I don't know if you have a teacher like that this semester or not. Um, some teachers are in love with both A and B, both B and C, all of the above, none of the above, all these other combinations. What I just described to you is here that these are just four separate choices, right? If you have a teacher who loves those other kinds of things, you can still do everything that I taught you here, except you just have to make a slight variation. So for example, if you cover up the choices and you read the question, and then you think, I know the answer, and you look, and you find it, and it's A. Because you know the way that teacher is, you stop for a second, and you look, and if you see an all of the above, or both A and B, then say, okay, I know this is right, but is that the only right one? And then look at the other ones quickly, and if you say, no, that's the only one, then go for it. So you just have to kind of be a little sensitive to that, because teachers are different. Also, I don't know if you have a teacher, or have had one, who likes this format, but a lot of teachers 
love to ask you a multiple choice question like this. All of the following are true about such and such except, and that's one of their main ways they do it. Well, if you think about it, if you get a question like that, you could keep these covered up for the next five years and you'd never be able to know the right answer. You have to look to see which one doesn't belong. But the smart move is to do a variation of this again, which is, okay, in just a second, I'm gonna move my hand and I'm gonna look at the choices. I'm looking for the one thing that's not true about this, so what do I know that is true? I know that, I know that, I know that, I know that. Okay, good, and then when you take your hand away after doing that, the wrong answer will flash off the page at you. It'll be so obvious. So again, it's the same idea, just again, just slight switches uh, depending on the teacher's style of asking questions. Um, now, uh, there are two basic things that I want to share with you kind of in closing on this. The first one is I want to give you a warning, and that sounds kind of serious, and actually it is. The benefits of taking a test this way are huge. They really help students, but the big concern, the big warning has to do with that word that I made a big deal of, and that is that one. Okay, when I was in college, I had this nightmare, recurring nightmare. I'd wake up in the middle of the night and all that, and it was because I was afraid I was going to do this. I would get to a test, I would do everything that I taught you, and I would get to the first question and read it and think, oh, no, I'll get to that later. Number two, know the answer, put it in the number one spot on the Scantron. Then every answer is one off. There's a great way to get an F on any test you ever take. And if you think about it, if you did this and you, got, you answered three in a row, you skipped one, you answered one, you skipped two in a row, it's easy to mess up and mark in the wrong place. Well, that nightmare never came true for me. I never did that because I was aware of it and I was careful. So here's what I did, and this is my suggestion to you on that. Since I'm already a two-handed test taker and I've got both of these things going on, whenever I got to a question and I knew the answer and I was ready to mark it, I would take my finger of my non-writing hand and point to the question number in the booklet, take my pencil, point to the question number on the Scantron, and look back and forth and match it, and then mark it. And if you do that, you'll never make a mistake. But you do have to be careful, because if you're kind of careless and quick about it, you could mess up. And I want to make sure you don't come back and hunt me down if you do that. So I've given you the warning on that. Okay, and then one last thing that I wanted to share is a quick little uh, personal illustration to show you again how interesting tests are and how everybody's mind works differently when they take a test. Um, when I was uh, in college, my personal all-time record, which is going to scare you in a minute with this, is that I took a test one time that had 100 questions on it, multiple choice. So pretty long test. Okay? When I got to the test, I, had, I was a good student, and I had studied hard and all that, but I was still kind of nervous because I wanted to do well, you know, just normal. When I got there, I did my preview, I did my calculation, and then I started here, because they're all multiple choice, and I did everything I taught you, except here's what happened. I covered up the choices for number one. I kind of recognized it. It was like one of those challenging ones. No. Two. No. Three, four, five, six, seven. No answers going down. And I finally got to question number 11 and I still had it marked no answers, skipped the first 10, which looked really bad. When I read the 11th question, the answer popped in my head. I took my hand away. There it was. I think I stroked the paper thinking, finally, I got one. And I actually marked the bubble on my Scantron. OK, now, when students are taking tests, two people could be sitting right next to each other taking the same test and they have the exact same knowledge of the subject so they're equal one could get an a one could get a c or a b because of how they manage their mind and their emotions during a test test taking is very you know emotional so here's what i want you to do i want you to kind of freeze frame my performance so far through this i have two ways i can look at this the first one is this after I've gone through all of this right here, how many, of, how many questions have I tried to answer? Tried. I've tried, right, I've tried all of them, tried 11, right? How many of those are right? One. One. Okay, what grade is that? <coughs> yeah, 
That's like a Q. That's like, that's like the worst grade ever. And I could, I could stop right there and think, I studied, and I thought I studied the right thing, but what's the, and you know, just start falling apart and getting all worried. That's not going to do any good. So I didn't look at it that way. Here's how I looked at it. How many questions have I answered so far? One. How many are right? One. <laughs> okay, what grade is that? A. A. Keep going. Plus. Yeah, because I like those pluses, right? So I could sit there and I think, there is no one in this room who's doing better on this test than I am, because how could you do better than perfect? <laughs> and that sounds so weird, because you say, uh, yeah, but how about those? And I said, no, nah, I had enough experience with this to know. And I went through the entire rest of the test. I answered a lot of questions. I skipped some more. And then when I went back up here, and I started doing the same thing again, most of these came right to me. And I thought, boy, my brain was on, off to a very slow start today. And then, um, <laughs> When I got the test back a week later, I ended up on this test, believe it or not, getting the highest score in the whole class. I got a score of 96 out of 100. But if you had walked up to me and leaned over my shoulder right here, you would have said, hey, just wanted to see how you're doing. Oh, better luck next time. You know, it looks like I'm going right down the tubes. but. Um, and I don't know why this is, you don't either. Sometimes when you walk in to take a test and you feel like you're ready, as soon as you get the test and you read the questions, your brain is just f smooth, fire and great. Other times, it isn't. And I always, I don't know if you've ever had an old car, but if you ever try to start an old car <laughs> and all that, and then once it starts, it takes a few minutes to warm up before you can even drive it. Sometimes when you go in to take a test and you start reading the questions, your brain's like an old car and it takes several minutes to sort of kick into gear. Well, if you don't know that and if you don't take steps to sort of relax through it, you can start getting very nervous immediately and doubt yourself and all that and things can fall apart. So that's again another reason for looking at it this way is that again, if you haven't studied and this happens, get nervous. But if you have studied and it's all in there, it's coming out. It's just not right now, so come back to it later and again, stay as relaxed as possible. That's the whole purpose here, okay? Um, questions on any of that? Okay, let me go ahead and if you could uh, pass the sign-in sheet forward. I just wanna always make sure I can read the names of the teachers, otherwise you're in big trouble. And if you don't know your teacher's names by now, you need a memory workshop. Okay, that's good. So I'll go ahead and uh, email these uh, people later. We're all done for today. Thanks for coming and uh, good luck on your finals. And again, look me up next semester if you're around and interested in more of this. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm.